Hi, my name is Pat Pirelli, and I used to be one of the worst puzzle solvers in the world. <laughs> my great grandpa Pitts, he used to, I used to go visit him, and he'd have all these, you know, uh, they were, it wasn't a Rubik's cube. It was, it was made out of wood, and I think it came from China, and it had all these little different things. And he had these horseshoes with these two chains in it, and you had to figure out how to get them out together, and then put them back, and do all these different things. And he, he probably had two dozen of those kind of puzzles like that. Of course, he'd just, I'm sure, give that to me to keep me in the corner and keep me busy, but I think it was good for me. As I got involved, I mean, deeply involved in the training of horses, I realized it was a puzzle to solve. And as I went through it, I realized you had to have, as some of you know that have read my book on natural horsemanship, <laughs> attitude, knowledge, tools, techniques, time, imagination, and even support. And as I went through my discovery, as soon as my attitude got very positive, progressive, and natural, it took me a while to get those three things lined up. I think I've always been a pretty positive person. Probably wasn't the most natural person, because when I was a young man, I was a rodeo bronc rider, and I could do all kinds of things. I was real athletic. I was gymnast and stuff, and I was strong. My dad was you know, two times Golden Gloves champion of New York, boxing champion. I came from, you know, a pretty, I don't know, athletic, aggressive, you could just do anything kind of a situation or scenario. So it probably wasn't so natural. I could, cause I could make horses do a lot of things. And I, I was studying pretty hard on how you make horses do things. And, of course, we had a lot of rough, tough cowboys in our area. And that's what I learned from. But as soon as I went positive, progressive, and natural, then that attitude led me to knowledge. And then that knowledge started expanding my world about what kind of tools could I use, should I use, why might it work, why might it not work. So in my quest for knowledge, I started finding out that were the logic behind certain tools. And basically, the two most sensitive places on a horse's body is the appetite and under the tail where the apples come out. And somewhere between, not halfway between, but somewhere, about a quarter of the way back, there's this place called the withers. And from the withers to the point of the shoulders, like, like where a horse would have a collar, a draft horse would have a collar on, is this real neutral spot on the horse. Well, I had this little roan mare, and her name was Scamp. And she was talented, feisty, and challenging. I remember trying to convince her that letting me put a piece of metal, you know, this little snaffle bit, in her mouth, oh, that wasn't good. That was not easy. And I don't mean the first time or the second time. I'm talking about several times. She just was not putting that in my mouth. And one of my teachers says, well, let's take a head stall here and let's take a little piece of rope and let's tie it there and let's make that the bit. Well, I did that several times in a row, several days in a row, until finally she's like, oh, well, you can put something soft like Well, then pretty soon I convinced her that I could put anything in there. So there's my quest for knowledge and trying to keep my attitude positive, progressive, and natural. I started learning more things. Well, lucky for me, about once a month, Tom Dorrance would come over. Now, Ronnie Willis was there five times a week. He was going to keep a real sh sharp eye on me. Tom would come over once or twice a month. So everything was going good, and I got this little cutting mare, and I'm working some cows, but every time I asked her to, to stop, and we had to turn left to go with the cow, sometimes, about every three, one out of three times, she'd get all scared, and then she'd kind of rear up a little bit, and before she could turn, and old Tom, he always had a little bag of tricks with him. So old Tom, he, he's there, he's watching, he says, well, and he's, I just asked him what he thought, he said, well, he reaches in his pocket, and he's like this, and he, pulls out a string, and he goes, here, tie this around her neck. And any of you that met Tom remember some of those kind of things. He had this little piece of string in his pocket, made out of parachute cord or something like that. And I'm like, mm -hmm. pretty handy, so he puts it around my horse's neck, and he says, now let's take that, that bridle off. So I took the bridle off. He said, now let's just try that again. But you use this for reins. So I did. I ride over there, stopped her with this string. He had me do a little few things, backed her up, and, you know, so she'd feel it and understand it. 
And then I backed her and she turned with the cow. And pretty quick, man, all of a sudden, this mare was working like nobody's business. I said, that's incredible. Here I am riding her with this string around her neck. And, and I'm looking at Tom, I'm all excited. I'm going, and she's made this much progress. And he says, oh, you can always make much more progress with the string around your neck than you can with that metal in her mouth. Off he walked. Well, I thought, after that day, I thought, you know, I'm going to keep me a little string in my pocket. And since I'm already making these halters and I've already got these made out of the yachting braid and I'm already making the lead rope and I've got all this stuff, ah, by golly, I made me a little six foot long string with a little eye in the end of it. Could do the same thing, ride my horse with a string around his neck and I started. So, I don't know, it might have been 1985 or something like that. I introduced to the world the progress string. Had them on the counter, had them on, at the clinics, had them there. People would come up and go, now what am I going to do with that? I said, oh, you can always make progress with a string. I think I sold about seven of them a year. Not too many people wanted to buy a progress string. And then several years later, I met Linda. I've still got the string in my pocket. I meet Linda, and she's pretty good at things like this. She says, well, why don't you change the name? If you think it's that, such an important tool and everybody should have one, everybody should, you know, it's like now all my students, especially my graduates, all of them always have a string. I carry usually two in my pocket, one on each side. And we even have a little joke around here for the, for the soda, um, uh, what do you call it? You know, when you get your, all your soda money together, if we catch you without a savvy string in your pocket, it's a $10 fine. So Linda comes up with this and says, well, why don't you call it something else? And like, what? She goes, well, you say savvy all the time or natural all the time. She says, try savvy string. <laughs> we sold out the first day, <laughs> just changing the name. And we started having little contests. How many ways could you use your savvy string? And all of a sudden, people started writing it. We stopped at 2,000. Now, here's my personal best story. I've got this belt buckle here. You see it right there? And that is one of my prides and joys. It was, uh, I think it was March, maybe April, <clears throat> spring, the grass was about this high. And I go out and I do seen something, I see a horse limping. So I go out there and um, I have nothing to, I didn't have a halter, I didn't want to walk all the way back to the barn. I'm, you know, I'm a half a mile from the barn. So I take, my, no, I take my belt, my buckle off, put it around the horse's neck, and I'm leading him back. Everything's going pretty good until a jackrabbit jumps up, and then the horse pulls out of my hand, and there goes my $200 belt and my priceless belt buckle that I won at a rodeo. It was made by um, the Letourneau belt buckle was the, the, the in thing back in the 60s and the 70s. So... There goes. Well, I finally get out there to the horse. The belt and the buckle are gone. Four months later, I'm out in the field riding the same field, but all the grass has been eaten down by the cows and the horses, and I found my priceless belt buckle. I'm going, if I would have just had one of those in my pocket, and that same scenario would have happened, I, it wouldn't have come off number one and number two. I wouldn't have been had four months of my life with a, you know, almost at a cardiac arrest state. So, the savvy string is something you can use on the end of your end of your carrot stick. It's something you can use to ride your horse. You can tie around your horse's neck to ride him around with. But there are literally thousands of uses. Every time I go on one of those um, scavenger hunts, they always seem like they ask for a piece of string. So I've always got one up on everybody. So, uh, I'd like you to do is write in your use, email us and say, what was your unique use of the Savvy String? We've already got thousands of them, and I'll bet you can come up with several. By the way, using it as a dog leash is already taken, so you can, you can forget that one. But come back and tell us and email us what is your most unique use for your Savvy String.